again, I do have a couple of quick questions of quick housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and the recording will be sent out by the end of the week. Feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will keep an eye on the chat and note down any questions for our speakers. And I will be asking the questions at the end of the presentation. And then finally, if you wanna learn more about Lily or presenting your own show and tell, I will write April's and my email address in the chat. And then now to our speakers. Our first speaker is Natalie Marquez from University of California, Irvine. Then it's Marcia Henry from California State University, Northridge. Then Mahalini Morrison from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. And finally, Emily Reed from Penn State University. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks, thanks so much for coming. It's nice to see you all. It's a big group. Uh, a little bit of background on me. I'm a library assistant from UCI and I've been there for five years, two years as a, as a part-time and uh, three years as a full-time um, uh, uh, person. And I love my job. I work in the reference department. So I really, really think it's fun. And uh, let me share my screen. I wanna make sure I get all my slides here. Can you all let me know if you can see that? Yeah, okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, let's do this really quickly. So sorry, let me get this situated. Can you still all see that or is it still? Uh, okay, good, okay, thanks. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, thanks for coming again. Today I will be highlighting several features of Zotero and RedCube papers. I think I'm at the end again, but um, let me know if you want me to continue after this. I can do that if you'd like. Um, uh, the things that I'm gonna focus on are price, compatibility, storage, and collaboration. The features I will discuss today are based off my own assessment, asking grad students, faculty, undergrads, and even staff what they loved and hated about each software. I will also add a couple of tidbits that I like to point out to patrons because I feel that they're very important. And some people have been asking them, especially grad students have been asking about certain things little by little. So um, just a little bit more of a background. A dear colleague of mine who passed earlier this year introduced me to bibliographic management softwares. They're very scary. And she was like, go for the scary. And she would lovingly teach EndNote to undergrads, but encouraged me to be versed in all the top contenders. She was very much a people person and would advise me that we listen to our patrons about their wants and needs in a citation software, which we do. We need to be versed in that. We don't need to know all the things as a librarians, but we need to at least know some of them so that way we can help them make the decision. They will ultimately make the decision what's best for them. So uh, let's get into it. Um, can you guys see that right now? Is that okay? Okay. So we're gonna look at Zotero. And this is the stuff that I'm going to mostly um, uh, talk about. Uh, again, price compatibility, storage and collaboration. And I will also mention privacy statements, tutorials and support, okay? Uh, so getting into um, Zotero, it's a free software, easy to use and based off of a simple design. Their Zotero privacy statement is very, very to the point. They don't want your information, they don't. They just want to be able to give this, um, this tool to you for you to use as you want. And uh, it's a downloadable software for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and a browser, and they have the browser extensions for Chrome, Firefox, or Safari. Safari is a little bit clunky, but it still works. I'll be using clunky a lot in some of the, in the Red Cubes as well. And the software is free with 300 mil, um, uh, megabytes of storage, but a patron can upgrade and pay a yearly fee for more storage. It's pretty expensive. There's also unlimited storage accounts for organizations like a lab of 15 people or an institution, 500 people or more. I think it's actually three to 500 people. They change it periodically. And that allows a set amount of users for a yearly fee. Um, Zodero, you can build a collaborative bibliography, which you can share as many people with as many people as you like at no cost. You can also sync your citation library across libraries across several devices and gain access to your libraries through any web browser, which is super helpful, especially now when we don't want to have our laptop on with us or um, we want to be able to go to a lab that has computers and stuff like that and not bring all of our electronics. Um, tutorials are very basic and super text heavy. That was one of the complaints that uh, the patrons have um, I've heard a lot is that they're just really super text heavy. They do have some visuals, but it's more very concise and um, you have to read between the lines and then ask for support. 
They are somewhat helpful, and I actually find the blog and free webinars very, very helpful. The, the, the blog is amazing. The free webinars are awesome, but they do cap their webinars at 100 people. And there's actually one coming up on December 9th directed towards librarians, but that one is full. But they will be sharing out the recording. recording. And again, they're awesome webinars. They're very, very helpful, and they like to take questions before and after. So if you wanted to sign up for a webinar, um, you can always submit your questions in their a little form, and then they um, they address them within the webinar. So that's nice. And then um, uh, I'm going to link right now to, um, let's see here if I can grab it really quickly. So sorry. And I, hopefully I didn't talk too fast, but I wanted to link to um, the BMS guide that I've created um the last two and a half years has been live and it's actually been pretty helpful i always update it and so it has some more information on there if you'd like to um let me i guess i have to unshare my screen if you'd like to have anything else with that um i know i did it really fast but is there any questions or we can wait until the end i'm sorry <laughs> and did you want me to do focus on red cube right now i can do that really quickly if you'd like Um, yeah, I think that's that's fine. Okay, cool. So let me share my screen one more time. Let's see here. Uh, getting to it. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, now I'm having technical problems. It's taking more time. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Okay. All right, so same thing. I just made the slide the same at Red Cube Papers and then the features price compatibility, storage, and collaboration with the, a section on privacy statement, uh, privacy statement, tutorials, and support. Um, now, um, I started getting requests about um, Red Cube Papers um, uh, 2019, the end of 2019. And um, our engineering librarian, Julia Gelfand, was very, very interested in getting in involved with it. And she had a lot of grad students and faculty ask for this to be added to our BMS guide. We're still not quite adding it just because it's it's geared towards the science or it, there's a lot of science um, heavy people using it more so often. So we are hoping to add it by January, the end of January, because we're seeing an uptick of people asking more about it. So, um, uh, right now, you know, same thing with EndNote. You can do a free trial. Um, they don't tell you how long the free trial it is, but so far, it's it's. I see it's thirty days. I've actually signed up for every single one of these, so that way I could test. And um, when people have asked me questions about um, uh, the certain or given complaints about the certain software, I try to look into it and see if I can find an answer or just kind of mimic the same uh, problem, so that way I can see if there's an I can do anything about it or support or something like that that I can give. So um, they do have a yearly subscription. It's $3 per month for a student. It's billed annually. It requires you to do a valid student ID and you can get a 40% discount, but they do ask additional um, questions. Now the 40% discount at, lets the student have it for $36 per year. And then um, I've just, um, Julia has also told me that there's a faculty and staff researcher discount. They can get the same 40% off for $60 per year. So, you know, it is, $36, it's still money, you know what I mean? It's, we don't know what our patrons are, are um, if what they're capable of. So $36 versus $60, it's still money. So free is always good. And then um, they do have a $5 per month academic version and a $10 per month corporate. Um, it doesn't seem like there's any um, uh, additional, uh, like, you know, services that are uh, vary between all those three sections. It's just the users, how many people can use this so um, academic, of course, is going to be an institution and then corporate is going to be um, there's an individual and there's also two, a two person corporate section. So I don't know why they do the two person corporate section, but that's OK. Um, uh, compatibility, the app is, and it's an app and there's a desktop app available. So it is compatible with Windows and Mac and then all compatible with all modern web browsers. Um, it's also compatible with um, smartphones and tablets iOS, it's much better. Android, it'll be clunky. Um, I am fortunate to live in a two um, uh, two phone uh, situation. So my I have an Apple and my, my husband has an Android. So we can always test it out with stuff, which I love to do. 
And then uh, the storage, um, uh, you do have to pay for a little bit more storage, but they sync library across platforms and devices, and there's enough storage space for PDFs. But when, um, just a little thing about this is when you and when you want to upgrade to the new papers from papers three to the new Red Cube papers, it's just called Red Cube papers, not Red Cube papers four. It does take a long time to um, um, to uh, update all of the or to um, sorry put all those PDFs onto the new platform. So it's it's it'll take a while, <laughs> and it's uh, it's not friendly with that. It doesn't give you a timeline, and so you're just waiting it around for a little bit. Um, I, I've taken two days so far, and it hasn't it's not done yet. So um, with collaboration, you can share and collaborate up to five private shared collections and with PDFs and references, and you can collaborate with 30 other users of papers. So it, these people, it, the other 30 people have to be papers users. You can't do it across from what I'm seeing so far, and, and please correct me if somebody has, um, has this knowledge, but um, you have to be, the users have to be signed up paper users as well. So that way you can share your library across to them. So that's kind of unfortunate. And then um, it also integrates with Overleaf and it integrates with Google Docs, which I really, really like. Um, I'm a big fan of Google Docs, so I tend to use that a lot more with this. Um, like I said, the bad the description has a you know a yearly subscription. Um, it's 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 money. It still could be expensive. Could not be expensive. It depends on what the patron is um, looking for and able to do. And then, like I said, um, the PDFs, it takes a little longer to do it. And then um, the live trains are the supports. The live trains are really good and they never seem to fill up. I've already, um, they have this calendar where you, which you just pick a time and then they let you have the time that you want. And I don't, I've never had a, um, a gotten an email saying that this session has been filled up. And um, the support that they have, um, you, you can email them through a ticket system, but they do have live chat that is available. And I've checked mornings, afternoons, and then 12 o'clock at night to see if they're available. And they've been able to answer my questions. Um, the tech support is really, really cool. Um, I've had to call them a couple of times just to get some information and, and kind of, you know, pretend that I don't know anything just to see what they're, uh, what they've done. And then um, the tutorials are short videos. They're very clear and helpful, less than four minutes uh, long. And I really like that. I'm a visual learner. So uh, the videos are very, very helpful. And they do a step by step, which is great. So um, and you can import existing libraries from other reference managers with just a few simple steps, which seems to be OK. It seems to be a little bit off sometimes, but it's still available to do. So um, uh, I wanted to link out the privacy statement just because I like that this yeah. have a section about um, uh, 13 year olds. <laughs> They, anybody under 13, if they see, uh, oops, if they see anybody who's um, under 13 that has signed up for Red Q papers, um, they will actually delete their information, but they do give you a very in-depth statement of what they're taking from you. Oh, why is it not letting me do it? I'm so sorry. So. Okay. All right, that's about it for me. I really appreciate you guys listening, but, and I look forward to your questions at the end. Okay, who should I take it, uh, send it off to? Oh, thank you so much, Natalie. And I think uh, Marcia Henry from CS CSUN could go next. Wonderful, thank you. Hi, Marcy. I think you're muted right now if you're um, talking. Sorry. Hi there. Um, my name is Marcia Henry, and I'm a reference instruction librarian. Um, I'm a medical librarian by training, and uh, I have been using en the free EndNote web, which now is known as EndNote Basic, but the term, the vocabulary still exists. It's also related to the EndNote Online. It is a free product. Uh, it was somewhere in the last 10 or 15 years. I remember I was teaching a class uh, which included it uh, using a citation manager and 
they had opened it up that night to South America, totally free. So it's been a while that it's been totally free. It is related to the subscription to Web of Science. Uh, there are two versions of EndNote Basics. So the free version, which has been free to the world for quite a while, only has 21 bibliographic styles and uh, you know limited number of filters and connections. Uh, the storage space, 50,000 references, which I, our doctoral students find that more than adequate. We do have doctoral programs at CSUN and several master's programs, and there's no problem with that. For attachments, uh, that's two gigabytes, which is also a lot for most people. And uh, I'll point out shortly uh, some of the reasons that uh, they don't. you don't really have to attach too many items uh, if it's currently available in our collection. So that that's uh, one thing to keep in mind. Then the other version is if you have uh, the EndNote Basic, which is a totally web-based platform, uh, has uh, a subscription to Web of Science, then you have access to the thousands of bibliographic styles of all the different journals and possibilities and hundreds of filters and connection files. Um, so, but th that requires a subscription to Web of Science. Okay, so I know this pr is probably hard to see and I, I can switch to a live demonstration of EndNote, but uh, I'm just wanting to uh, point out uh, when I work with students and I have been working with students for many years, my classes can have anywhere between 20 to 50, 50 plus students in it. Some of them are definitely distance ed students. Uh, in spite of COVID, they were all distance ed students during COVID. And um, there's quite a bit of variety of computers that they have and devices. So it's it's an interesting experience to have. But what, what my talk is going to talk about the uh, students every, a lot because that's, what I grapple with every day, how to improve how I teach this to students and get them going so that they really adopt it. Um, so that the, this is a welcoming screen when they first, uh, they have to sign up for it. They have to leave time so that they can verify, the, uh, the, they have to get a message from EndNote and they have to be verified, et cetera. And it's, it's really not important that they are, are currently registered student right now because we don't have web of science we we just stopped it this past year because scope is was offering a better price we couldn't afford both which we did want to have both but that wasn't uh feasible at this point so uh was a price war that that's a separate we don't have to know that but <laughs> um so the, the, they they go over the different features for the students if the students can take a time it takes the time to go over that. I take the time to go over that the ribbon the the gray ribbon at the top, uh, which uh, which they have uh, the tutorial calls it fine, but there's also the gray ribbon at the top will say collect. Uh, then there's also organize, so that has the the ability to share. Uh, uh, files with your the records with uh, your co-students. We'll get to the other slides that go over that. So totally free, lots of storage. Okay, getting started. Where where can they get help? Well, they have lots of one. They can get help from me because I do work with the students and I I offer all sorts of extra help and and separate Zoom sessions for some people that are very self confident in person or on Zoom. Okay, so, but, but they have that getting started online guide that I pointed out to you. Clarivet, which is the current company of, uh, that supports Web of Science, as well as EndNote and a variety of different products that they're coming up out with. Um, they, they have a, a variety of different train, library guides, training, chat, of whatever you can think, but also what I use and have been using for years, which I tend to, I find it uh, very important because uh, you run into problems with computers, uh, laptops that I, I just don't have that experience that there's a 24 
and the current currently it's a 24 7 telephone help monday through friday uh, that's the telephone number that's not available saturday and sunday but this website is open and i honestly don't know i haven't used it enough for the live chat uh, but i just noticed in preparing that they offer that so there there's a lot and as far as other libraries, the YouTube, including Clarivit, the Clarivit videos are on YouTube and, and other libraries. A lot of people have EndNote, especially academic libraries. A lot of community college libraries have it also. <clears throat> so it has been a very established uh, product over the years. And there's uh, lots of different uh, possibilities to uh, get some tips. Um, okay, so my point is that uh, how the students re react to this. So the the idea of you know how are they going to collect uh, their references? Well, I make try to make it very clear that one most of the time they're not going to uh, have to fill out a form themselves. They're going to be able to export the information from our different databases and our um, and our OneSearch. <clears throat> So that, and uh, that's pretty exciting. And when I demonstrate that, I like that a lot, that there's something to start with right off in their, uh, in their free and no basic account. Okay, the idea of a new, the, that they can actually create their own. I, I, I showed that because one, I wanna be sure that they understand all the different forms, et cetera, so that, uh, that are available. I also go over the import references because I, I want to point out that PubMed takes a special uh, file, a PubMed NBIB file. From, and since I'm a medical librarian, it might not be important to uh, uh, all the students that uh, uh, I encounter who are using EndNote, but it is important to the ones that I work with. And uh, then the RefMan RIS, I find very helpful for them to know about. Okay, so four, let's see, I'm scrolling down. One more, five, format. So when I go most, let's see, I don't want to skip anything. Organize, organize. This is um, an inter interesting section. Most of my students also will, if not for the, class that I'm giving, I'm giving at least three to six hours, two different sessions to work with. Well, that is usually a class that has at least on an average of 35 to average. But as I say, it varies from 20 to over 50 students so that um, manage my groups where they're doing a group project and they ha have different sections that they're finding their articles for and building a bibliography together. So that that's important for them to know to how to set up a group and uh, share it with others. There's also a way to remove duplicates. And I've been reading the literature and I believe one article I read uh, said that EndNote does that better than anybody, any other citation manager. I have nothing to back that up, but they do have a good duplicate uh, program to remove the duplicates. Okay. All right. Then we go into when they go into format the site while you write plugin. Uh, that's a big hit with students demonstrating how uh, they can. Uh, now, what I should do is remind, I, I don't know if that's necessary. Most people might be, it, it's probably the same for the other citation managers. So, just in I don't want to use up too much time because we have several other speakers, uh, but uh, this this image that I have over here, uh, there is a plugin for EndNote, and they have to be the students need to be shown to how to how to set the preferences so that if they're interested in the online version and not whatever the current version of the desktop EndNote is that automatically drops down. I might say that we have in our teaching labs, we have three teaching labs with a total of, I think close to a hundred computers that have the EndNote plugin in Microsoft Word. 
And so students this, in the days of wanting to offer equity and inclusion for our students, if for some reason they don't have a computer or don't have Microsoft Word, because it does require Microsoft Word, uh, Natalie mentioned Google Docs. Um, uh, it's right now, EndNote does have a workaround, so they can provide some help with Google Docs, but it's they really are expecting students to have Microsoft Word. And our institution does offer Microsoft Word free to students, so it it's it's a possibility, and they have to take the extra step. But if they don't, we do have this in our teaching labs. So when there is no class there, they're welcome to be uh, to get to that uh, to EndNote Web. It is a web product, and that has to be explained very carefully. Um, so that and you. So that it explained that it'll insert uh, references that they have to format their uh, citations, that uh, they have to do something about improving their citations before they work on, before they do that. And then there is a, a workaround for Google Doc. Okay, I went over those different points. So even though traditionally it didn't work with Google Docs. They have created something uh, for that. And I can talk about that in the question and answer if people are interested, or you can reach me at mhenry at csun.edu. Okay, a full citation record. They have to be told that they have to show the empty field. You know, people get stuck on these little things that if you don't take time to explain it, they don't realize if they have an annotated bibliography, they have to expand the record so that they can get to the research notes field. So that that's something you can't take for granted. The students will get to do that. Um, let's go down. Uh, exporting records. For those of you who have used web of uh, the EBSCOhost databases, and I, I would assume everybody has in Web of Science, you'll notice that there is, besides the RIS file, there's also an export to EndNote Web. And um, every once in a while, there's a glitch with it, but um, it's been working for years and years. It's very, once you once you start your research, it'll, and you have your EndNote open, and you have your EndNote basic account open, it'll continue to, uh, export to EndNote Web without ex any extra logins. Using the RIS file uh, might get kind of takes a little extra time. That has to be pointed out so that they get efficient use out of that. Exporting records from PubMed. Uh, so you have to explain that it will take an EndBib file and how to set up that in the uh, formats. So uh, those are all possibilities. Um, I know that's hard to see. Exporting records from Google Scholar. Um, we have and exporting from our, our OneSearch, our discovery system. I think I skipped that. I, I That was one of the files up front that I uh, didn't, I managed to go over that, pass over it. We, we have as a tool EndNote as well as an RIS choice that works very smoothly with EndNote. No, so but Google Scholar takes some extra steps. Um, one, you uh, the Google Scholar, you want them to um, set up their uh, bibliography. They, I think, and they don't call it a citation manager. I think it's a bibliography. There is a setting in the settings. Uh, they, you also want to set up so that they Google Scholar so that they have their um, they they know their stu uh, holdings set it up with your university's holding. So those are all extra steps that you're, uh, I have to teach before they get to the EndNote part and getting in, uh, material into EndNote. But there is a site that there is something in Google Scholar that will allow them to create. Uh, I, I recommend the RIS file because that's kind of universal, um, but the EndNote would work also so that it can import records. Now, this is showing um, uh, EndNote where we are have connections. This is when the student is actually on campus. There's no problem with their seeing uh, connects. This is their EndNote account where they've exported from 
uh, the, I can tell this is a web of science file, but there's a, this, there's always this a very clear full text that takes them back into the discovery system. So the idea of adding um, attachments for files isn't so necessary because they can always get to most of the items they have. Now, if they got something on interlibrary loan, they may want to add an attachment. But the students need to point, to, most students need to be told just where it is on that, that long uh, record file. Once they have clicked on show empty fields, uh, that, that doesn't catch many students' eyes, but there is room to add the full PDFs, and uh, there is room to add individual tables from articles. It's uh, if if that's what they want. If they're sharing files, if they have sharing files, uh, the the files that they share don't don't carry over any attachments they have, so they need to be warned about that. Okay, so here is one of the, I don't know how much time I have left, but um, I, this is one of the problems I always, I always emphasize because they don't automatically notice that they, that their little word processing editors by each field. And so that takes some time to, uh, um, to point out to students how, how to make corrections. This is the biggest problem I have with the students, because I I can have classes when they're over 50, they usually have a, a certain percent of graduate students who do adopt this much faster and easier. Maybe they've written more papers and they're more familiar. Uh, I specialize in the APA 7 style. Most of the, almost all my students use the APA 7 style. And, um, there are many possibilities of making, you have to make corrections. And when you make the corrections, in order to really use this efficiently when you're writing a paper, it doesn't help that you're working on um, writing a paper and you still have, and you're not, you don't know your APA seventh uh, rules. So I have, there's a certain amount of time I have to spend on the rules for um, capitalization. So there's quite a bit of everything in yellow here is what, what I needed to, uh, I didn't correct it, which I normally do. And I, I don't take class time, a lot of class time, but I have to show at least one example of doing this or the three examples I usually uh, demonstrate uh, when I show them why they want to have a citation manager. Uh, I correct those before I, I I've corrected them before I demonstrated so that they come out, per, you know, perfectly. And in this case, um, I didn't just to remind you that uh, there is a lot of error. Now, all of this, all the different products we use, including our discovery system says you need to check for your style. You're responsible for the note to know the APA 7th, but that that does take some time. I also have looked through some of the literature, and uh, this is from an article, uh, at, and they compared the different, several different uh, Mendeley, RefWorks, Zotero, and according to this, people have been counting errors, et cetera, and I don't know why those errors don't match for the, why Zotero might do a better job in as far as sentence case, changing sentence case, et cetera, for the lower, for the APA style, the capitalization, uh, I'd be interested in pursuing that a little bit later, but that's, uh, but that's, you do have to be sure that the students understand they have to know the rules and they, it's not a, it's not a, error on EndNotes part, part they're, they're offering you this, the uh, word editor to make those corrections, which are simple enough to do. Um, if there are any questions, I can't, uh, I don't, have I run out of time? Are you know, my 10 minutes over? Um, oh, I, I think it's fine. Um, okay, I can share, I can actually go in. I have, unless it, it's gone to sleep, I can share 
the screen to my EndNote. Where is my EndNote document Word launch soon? Have I lost it? Document Word. Or, okay, again, within, uh, I, I, are you seeing that I have a Microsoft Word document open? Is yes, that, I can see the document. Okay, okay I, I, now, if I click on EndNote, and hopefully, okay. So what they have to be taught that, that they have to set the preferences, they have to go into application. They have to, because it doesn't automatically know that they're interested in EndNote online. So th this is a pull down menu, et cetera. So that's something that, um, and they fill in, they have to know just when they sign up, they want to know um, when they sign up and I tell them to sign up with their, CSUN email, it's not required, it, it, uh, but if they're going to be sharing groups with um, for assignments that are group projects, uh, they want to be able to rely on knowing the persons they can always ask, but it is easier if it's consistently they use their CSUN email so that there's no guessing, and which is very you know retrievable in the director student directory if they're sharing uh, different records for a project so and then also what oh that's not automatic and they they don't they're they get some students get confused that they haven't set it to the style that they need and then when they need to actually insert citations this is a really a big hit i usually don't have a document started i i do a um a giving giving credit credit uh and then making sure they uh, that's a good time to talk over plagiarism and, and how they would be considered scholars. This is the important part. I am confusing some of my different things here. Are you still looking at my word? I have lost my word. But anyway, I, I assert, I, I prepare a statement uh, where I, I put in three different authors' names and show how, um, It'll insert in the bottom, the full reference at the bottom. I think I've lost my connection here or it's done something funny on my screen. I'm not quite sure what I've done wrong. I don't, I don't know what you see, but I've lost my screen to do this. I'm sorry, there's, sorry about that. But uh, let me add that the idea of demonstrating it, inserting an alphabetical order is um, I'm going to stop sharing because it's not working right for me. And I don't know, I could try that once more. But what I do is do a demonstration where the the person's last name uh, goes in the middle, the third three records, the person in the middle and the middle one for alphabetical order to prove that it will put it in alphabetical order for that. It'll do the insight citation and the alpha and um, the, uh, put things in alphabetical order. Just there's a big wow. It's very gratifying that they that it captures their attention and they're really interested in getting their NOTA basic account. And um, I thank you for your attention. And I hope I covered all the points. Thank you so much, Marcia. And now to Mahogany Morrison from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. Oh, you're muted, by the way. Sorry about that. I do it every single time. Um, I'm going to try my best not to take up too much of your guys' time. And I also apologize. I don't have slides. Um, I was just going to do a, a live demonstration to introduce you guys to the to the citation manager that we use at the Chicago School, which is RefWorks. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, so as you can see, I'm already in RefWorks when, oh, um, I will say RefWorks is a ProQuest product. And um, in terms of subscriptions, there are two options. Uh, there is a personal paid subscription or an institutional subscription. And obviously for the institutional subscription, your users would have access to it for free. And there is also a 30 day trial, I believe for the, individual subscription. Okay, now into it. Um, so when you first log in, it often takes you straight to all references. And 
I don't really need to explain what that is. That's pretty much all the references you have ever inputted into RefWorks. Um, what I will show you about this is the view. This is the normal view. It normally gives you just a portion of the citation as well as any tags and um, folders that your citations may be in. I'm personally a huge fan of the citation view. This is because the citation view will allow you to see if you're missing any pertinent information in your citations before you have reports make the citation. I'm sorry, make the bibliography for you. So anything in blue with a question mark is reference basically telling you that it's not sure if this is necessary. You may want to look into this. Anything in yellow is basically saying this is pertinent information and you should probably look into this to complete your citations. So I'm a huge fan of the citation view. Um, if you click on a citation, I just want to click on one randomly, it'll open up this pop-up, which will give you more bibliographic information, as well as ways to access the full text. So um, using the full text link resolver usually takes it to uh, my school's discovery tool, which is OneSearch, where I can access the item. Or there is often URLs, which will also take you directly to the item. You can click on this little pencil to edit anything in this. And there's two main things I wanna note on. Uh, first is the abstract. A lot of my students really love that if they're doing an annotated bibliography, if you put your annotation in the abstract section, that's where RefWorks will pull that annotation from. So just put your annotation here in the abstract and you're good to go and you can just make your annotated bibliography like normal. Uh, I didn't necessarily wanna talk about this, but you can add tags or get rid of tags here as you see fit. Um, the attachments, that's the one that I wanted to talk about briefly. Um, you can basically upload a PDF of whatever item that goes with this citation. Um, it's not completely necessary for things that our um, students have access to through our subscriptions, but for things like interlibrary loan, it could be helpful for our students to just upload the item directly into RefWorks. So that way they're not looking at this at two, like multiple different locations. And all of this other information is edible and you can add more fields as you see fit. And getting out of that is just as easy. Okay, so I'm gonna move on over to our side panel over here. Um, last important is exactly what you think it is. It's just the most recent citations that you've imported over um, divided by time. Uh, we also have a duplicates function in RefWorks. So, um, Love this function. Uh, we often teach our students to just, when they're working on their um, citations, to kind of just put citations into RefWorks indiscriminately. Like, don't worry about if you've seen it before, because you can always just get rid of the duplicates. And it's also very helpful, obviously, when sharing folders. If you have multiple people working on a, a project at one time, students don't have to worry about if their group member have already put that citation into RefWorks. Oops, okay. Sharing also pretty straightforward. It's just a click of a button to share. I will say that RefWorks when sharing, you do not, uh, you can share to those who don't have a RefWorks account. However, that is a view only. If you want your group members to be able to actually edit these folders or add to these folders, they will need a RefWorks subscription. And here are the folders. This is a big one that we show our students or we expect our students to use. Um, for our subscription with RefWorks, you can have an unlimited number of folders as well as an unlimited number of citations. Um, so we have our students, or we suggest our students to you know, make a folder for project just to keep your assignments as organized as humanly possible. I've actually known a student to um, make a folder for their dissertation and then make subfolders within that dissertation folder for their different chapters. And they said it helped them tremendously. So it's a really cool and useful function. I'm gonna quickly show you my Halloween folder um, because it's gonna be an example of what a shared folder looks like. So as you can see, I have four folders and my Halloween is the only one with the little people icon that's matching the sharing icon. So that's how you know that this folder has been shared. And within this folder, here are my eight citations. I obviously didn't put all of these in here because this second one has a little person icon, which means that my group member was the one who inputted this citation into this folder. So this is just an example of what sharing the folder looks like. And then I don't know what these little dots are called. I guess more options. I always call them a vertical ellipses, whatever it is. 
Um, this is how you would add a subfolder and then various different ways of editing, like renaming, sharing settings, finding duplicates, deleting, so on and so forth. I am going to uh, switch my folder really quick to show you the difference between trash and delete. So obviously you can see trash right here, and then there's a delete all the way up here at the top. It's gray because I haven't chosen anything. Um, so when you are just in a folder or last imported or all references, this delete function will put your citations into this trash folder. So if I go ahead and click on this and say, I don't want this anymore, I can go ahead and just delete it. You have the remove for folder or move selected to trash. So if I move it to trash and then I click on trash, it's right here at the top. And while you're in trash, if you use the delete function, that's when it's permanently deleted. So you can think of the trash um, folder, I guess, as kind of like the, the trash icon on your computer. You dump things in there, but it's not actually deleted until you permanently delete it. And I'm personally a huge fan of that. The students that I have talked to and worked with are a huge fan of that because they have, you know, put something in the trash thinking that they were done with it and reality they're not, but it's right there. So it's easy for them to reaccess. So now moving over to the top bar, um, adding, obviously, that's a necessary function. <laughs> So you can add uh, by uploading documents, importing references, or manually creating a new reference. Um, however, there are also significantly easier ways of doing it, like um, our discovery tool, OneSearch, um, all of our databases, and like Google Scholar will all export citations into RefWorks. And if you're on a website that does not have a way to export citations, RefWorks also has this handy little save to RefWorks bookmarks that pretty much works on just about any website. And I will show you how you can get access to this as well. Uh, create bibliography, pretty straightforward. This is just gonna create the bibliography for all the citations that you have um, or for the citations in a folder. You would choose your um, citation setting and then copy to clipboard, paste it in your document and edit as you see fit. If you're interested in in-text citations, Clicking on Create Bibli Bibliography and Quick Cite. And can you guys see this pop up or do I need to reshare my screen? I'm unable to see the pop up. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, perfect. So here's the pop up. You would choose your citation style, hit continue and then choose the citations that you want an in-text citation for. Um, the citations would obviously be up here. You can just copy and paste, and you can do multiples at a time. Then you can hit Create Bibliography, and it'll create a bibliography only for the citations that you chose. Now, if you want them to do a bibliography for all the citations, really easy, just click Include All, and then it's the citation for everything, and then copy to clipboard like usual and paste it in your document. Okay, now I'm gonna, hopefully you can see my my regular ref works now. Yeah, I could see it. Okay, perfect. And then the last thing I'm gonna show is tools. So this is where you can get that install to ref works little bookmark up here. It's really simple, it's literally just dragging and dropping and then now you have it and you can use that as you see fit for websites that won't allow you to um, export citations and then down here marcia talked about it a little bit for endnote but this is the instructions for um, getting add-ons or plugins for your different word processors uh, refworks works with uh, microsoft word google docs and hangul i have no idea what hangul is but it's an option and I'm not gonna show you guys how to install it because I wanna make sure our next person has plenty of time and we have time for questions. So I apologize if I talked really fast, but that's what I have for you guys. It's all the basics of RefWorks. Thank you so much, Mahogany. Now to our last presenter, which is Emily Reed from Penn State University. Great, thank you. Okay, and we are seeing my PowerPoint. Looks good. Great, thank you. 
All right, so hi everybody. I'm Emily Reed from Penn State University Libraries, um, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about Mendeley. Um, I do want to point out it is an Elsevier um, product, so I know for some people that's immediately a turnoff, um, and you may want to use one of these competitors instead. Um, but Mendeley is a citation manager um, that I have used, um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about it. All right, so um, some key features of Mendeley um, is that it does have both a desktop client and the online tool available for free. So unlike EndNote, which only the web version is available for free, um, but more similar to Zotero and RoughWorks, you can download the desktop client for free. Um, with your free account, you can use up to uh, two gigabytes worth of data. Um, and I'll talk um, on the next slide about the different plans you can also get. Um, it does work with Microsoft Word, OpenOffice, and LaTeX. Um, it does not currently work with Google Docs. Um, I haven't heard if that's something that they're working on, but I hope so. <laughs> A lot of students are using Google Docs more and more. Um, it does generate bibliographies. You can also import directly from databases. Because it is an Elsevier product, it is integrated directly into ScienceDirect and Scopus. So if you use either of those databases frequently, then Mendeley might be a good option for you. It also does have a bookmark feature that you can use to import a web page, but the accuracy of that import is going to depend a lot on the indexing of the web page itself. So if the web page has really bad indexing, then you're not going to get a very good import and you might have to change it um, quite a bit. Mendeley does also have an online catalog that you can use to search. Um, and I actually just started trying the Mendeley catalog. I had been primarily importing um, using bulk methods or using a DOI to import. But I did um, just a few weeks ago try out the Mendeley catalog for the first time. I thought it worked pretty well. You can search by title um, to import sources. Um, it does well with journal articles. It does not do as well with book chapters, um, which makes sense. So if you are also reliant on book chapters or books, um, it does have trouble finding those because they are not indexed. You can also enter um, an, a manual um, or an entry manually. Um, I have noticed that Mendeley, compared to some of the other citation managers that we have discussed, Mendeley does not have quite as many options for this uh, manual entry when you're selecting a source type. It has journal article, book, book chapter, report, um, and some other types, but I have found that um, Zotero has more options. Um, when you are creating a manual entry of a citation. You can highlight and annotate files in Mendeley. Um, if you have a PDF there, you can highlight it, uh, you can annotate it, and that saves directly there in Mendeley. You can also tag your citations, um, and that's something that I like to do. I'm currently using Mendeley for two different research projects. Um, and I create my own tagging vocabulary. And what I like to do is when I have you know, um, hundreds of sources that I'm dealing with, I like to look at the intersections of those tags that I develop and see which ones have the same two tags, um, because then I can, you know, write about a theme revolving around those. Um, if you upload the PDFs into Mendeley and the PDF file that you upload is searchable, then Mendeley will search the full text of the PDFs that you have uploaded for you. But if um, you upload a PDF that's not searchable, for example, JSTOR, a lot of the PDFs that are in there, they're not searchable. If that's the kind of PDF they are uploading, then the full text search will not work. And you can have group libraries and share PDFs in your group libraries. For free, you can create and own up to five libraries um, and you can join up to 25. And for a single library, um, each library can have a max of 25 members. So here are the uh, plans that you can um, opt to purchase if you don't want the free version, which gives you two gigabytes of space. Um, there's the plus version for $4.99 a month, the pro for $9.99, and the max for $14.99. Um, the max, which says it is unlimited personal library space, 
you see an asterisk there. It's not actually unlimited, but kind of is. There is a limit. I think it's like 200 gigabytes um, of space. And then if you need more than that, they will give it to you, but you have to ask them. So if you want more space, you just have to contact them to ask for that space. Okay, so um, I did want to make sure that I hit on the big announcement. Um, this went out in February, um, so it's not really quite so breaking news anymore. But the Mendeley desktop client called Mendeley Desktop is no longer available for download. Um, it's being replaced with Mendeley Reference Manager, which is their new desktop client. Um, and what they said is Mendeley Desktop, the old version, is not going to continue to be supported and it will go away eventually. They have not set a date for it to go away, um, but they are planning on it not being around. So they are suggesting that you migrate to their new Mendeley Reference Manager. I did download the Mendeley Reference Manager a few weeks ago because I hadn't done that yet. Um, and it was actually really simple um, and very easy to just log into my account, find everything there. It was very easy. So a little bit about the new uh, desktop client, the Mendeley Reference Manager. It mirrors their online version. So it's a more seamless user experience if you're used to using the online version, then the new Mendeley Reference Manager um, operates very similarly. It also syncs automatically, which in the Mendeley desktop, you had to manually push the sync button, which was problematic when you were doing group projects. If you forgot yeah. to hit the sync button, then your files would not be shared with your collaborators. And then they do have a new Word plugin as well, Mendeley site um, that works with the Mendeley reference manager. And here are some resources I will uh, paste these into the chat so that you have these um, uh, links. Um, I have the Penn State Mendeley guide, and then we also have um, the citation tools comparison, which looks at Zotero, RefWorks, Mendeley, and EndNote and compares them. So I have that listed there as well. And then I did um, just put in a link to Mendeley and, well, it's actually the Elsevier privacy policy. Um, so I will post those into the chat. All right, so I think um, that's all I'm gonna say about Mendeley unless we have questions. All right, thank you so much, Emily. So now I will get to questions. We have a little bit of time left, so I'll ask a few. So this one is for Natalie Marquez and Jennifer asks, is the Red Cube student subscription only for the US or how do you verify your student ID? Um, yes, thank you, Jennifer. I, I had, um... Uh, I, I tried to answer it in the uh, chat, but it looks like there's um, they just ask for your school or institution email address and they ask you to verify it. So you get an email um, a note code and you're supposed to input it after you sign up. So I'm still looking for information to see if there is um, anything else about P, um, institutions that do not have an EDU email. I haven't found anything yet. So to be continued. But thank you, Jennifer, for that question. Okay, thank you. And then the last question, I believe it's for everyone, and this was asked by April. Is there any reason they chose the citation manager over others? In my experience, a lot of the times people keep using the ones they used first. I Can I answer that really quickly? I, I started out with EndNote um, when I was a graduate student at American University in Cairo. Um, and I didn't, uh, I didn't get a very good description about it or like a tutorial about it. And then when I came over to UCI, Zotero was the friend, you know, even though my colleague really, really liked EndNote, um, uh, she had me research all the other ones and try to take into account what I needed for myself. And for my research purposes, Zotero was the best. So I continue to use Zotero. I decided to present on RidQ because, or, you know, talk about Red Cube because there's a lot of papers because there's a lot of people getting excited about papers in our in our um at our university so we're still it's it's getting a, a an uptick of of interest and so we want to make sure if we need to put it on our BMS guide um bibliographic management citation guide um 
or software guide, then we need to include it. So we want to make sure that patrons know what's out there and what may the, be the best one for them. So, um, so yeah, you, you know, I, I don't think I would use papers on my own. I prefer Zotero. It's, it's pretty easy for me for what I'm doing, but um, I'm open to change. I, I, I go to the webinars and I, you know, I do stuff. So that way, if I'm interested in later on changing, then I can, but that's just me. <laughs> And then does anyone else want to add on to that? I have a question for Emily about uh, uh, Scopus. I, I I find Scopus um, doesn't have an easy export uh, in it. You have to register. Uh, I don't normally have to mention Scopus, but we are using it now. And uh, how does it export into whatever's bibliographic management software people may have. It doesn't show an export like some of the other, EBSCOhost does so clearly and some of the others. Yeah, I'd have to check. I'm not a big Scopus user, um, but it does have Mendeley integrated because they're sister products. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure about exporting to other formats though. I'd have to look. The database is, well, well, if you actually have Mendeley, is it easier because you have Mendeley or you just have an exported from? Yeah, they have an Scopus. export to Mendeley feature right built into Scopus. You have to um, conduct the search first. Yeah, I was playing with that earlier um, in Scopus. Yeah, and they have a direct export into Mendeley option. But for other citation managers, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's got to yeah. be a way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, uh, I may I may contact you a little bit later after I look at it again. Thank you. And you're, uh, everybody, I really appreciate everybody's presentations. Very interesting. Okay, then thank you to all our fantastic speakers. Our next show and tell will be how to engage K through 12 groups in your academic library on December 14th, featuring Morgan Jones and our former public librarian. We hope to see everybody there.